Lani sir and Dr. Viral. Uh, I'm a last minute replacement. Yesterday night we got the call from Dr. Nandita. She could not come because of high grade fever. Thanking Abbott for supporting this talk, but this is completely, uh, it does not have equipment. So even it is supported by them, but I don't have any disclaimer to make on this particular talk. I am going to talk in next 18 minutes, the focus on time in range through continuous glucose monitoring in target for better clinical outcomes in diabetes. Now, first very important message which I want to give to everyone that if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And I think one of the major reasons for our country not to have a very good control of diabetes is because people are not measuring the diabetes. There are three pillars to manage diabetes or dysglycemia. Actually, chronic hyperglycemia is to be treated it was DCCT and UKPDS trial taught us that yes, type 2 diabetes is to be treated. If you get a good control of diabetes, you are going to have less and less complication. But unluckily, it was the hypoglycemia which was a limiting factor for a tighter glycemia control and we could not achieve a tight glycemic control for most of our patients. And then in last decade, one thing which we have realized, it is glycemic variability which is also very important and emerging glycemic target. It is the glycemic variability which is also responsible even if you achieve a good A1C control, still you get a lot of complication. It is because of the glycemic variability. Let me give you one example. This is one type 1 diabetic patient measuring 4 times sugar. As per international recommendation, a type 1 child measuring 4 times sugar, you can see almost all reports are relatively good control. And I am sure the clinician, the patient, the caregiver, everything, everyone will be happy. But what about the continuous glucose monitoring? If I do the same patient a CGM, you will find the patient actually developing pre-lunch hypoglycemia, post-lunch hyperglycemia, and there is a midnight hyperglycemia also. So continuous glucose monitoring is like a videography, while doing a random blood glucose monitoring is like a photography. It's a simple example. Someone can say you have a 600 doctors registered for a meeting, but only 30 or 40 doctors are sitting. Unless you do a videography, you will not find in which particular hall, how many number of doctors were attending and how many were going out. The similar way, if you don't do the continuous glucose monitoring, you will not able to know. It is a random blood glucose monitor, which is at that point of time, maybe normal or maybe abnormal, because it never tells you what is going to happen after four hours. So how do we monitor our glycemic control? We monitor our glycemic control by A1C. You may have two different type of patient with the same A1C, but one patient may have less glycemic variability, other may have very high glycemic variability. I give you one more example. This slide we have taken from uh, a diabetes care, which was published. There are four different type of patients, all of them have a similar A1C with 8. But you will find on first patient, actually it is the fasting hyperglycemia which is responsible for their high A1C. The second patient, actually there is a fasting hypoglycemia, but still the patient A1C is same. The third patient, it is a post breakfast, post lunch and sugar is very high and there is a reason A1C is high. And the fourth patient, it is only the post dinner sugar which is high and that's the reason A1C is 8. So you may have a patient with 8 A1C. Unless you do the continuous glucose monitoring, all these four patients will require different approach to treat these patients and that is what precision diabetology is. You can't treat all these patients with the same way. If they have 8 A1C, you can't increase the dose of whatever the medication which you are giving and you may end up with the patient with hypoglycemia. So this you can achieve only through continuous glucose monitoring. So what's the rational? Do you think that each and every patient needs continuous glucose monitoring? Yes, if possible because A1C does not track glycemic excursion. 60% glucose low, which patient may not have the symptoms, will not be revealed on self-monitoring of blood glucose. Continuous glucose monitoring identify four times more serious glucose excursion than self-monitoring of blood glucose. And I am talking of self-monitoring blood glucose mean four times in a day. It's not SMBG or random blood glucose monitoring, which we do sometimes once in a day. So it is useful for those who are not matching their A1C goal, having frequent low glucose level, they are unaware of their low glucose 
sugar level they are not able to achieve the targets without increasing the hypoglycemic events and those children and adolescents who can afford to use the continuous glucose monitoring so the classification we have real time which is available in our country we have intermittently scanned cgm which is flash cgm which is also available to our country we have blinded professional cgm which is also available with us libre pro and uh, i pro and we have integrated cgm within the pump also we have a cgm so all four varieties of continuous glucose monitoring is available luckily in our country now do we have a scientific evidence do we have a data to support that yes by doing cgm you are going to decrease the risk of hypoglycemia and still you are achieving a tight glycemic control i started talking with the dcct trial which was done in type 1 to achieve a1c of 7 that was the target but they could not the mean a1c of these children were 9 and they could reduce it to the 7.2 but at the risk of developing hypoglycemia which is 62 per 100 patients year it is in 1983 then after 25 years these patients were put on a continuous glucose monitoring and this was a jdrf trial jdrf continuous glucose monitoring the mean a1c of these children was 7.6 they could achieve a1c by 7.1 what different things they have done from dcct to jdrf cgm these patients were put on a continuous glucose monitoring and you can see the result the risk of hypoglycemia from 62 it has reduced to 20 in again after eight years there was a pivotal trial where these patients were put on a cgm along with pump therapy also it was integrated cgm and you will be surprised the mean a1c from 7.7 .7, it had come to 6.9 but the risk of hypoglycemia became zero so no hypoglycemia and still you are achieving for type 1 children so this is what the the advantage of this continuous glucose monitoring and the pump and the technology used for type 1 diabetes now we have a lot of data for type 1 but anyone can ask because we have a lot of type 2 diabetic patients do we have the data for supporting it using continuous glucose monitoring for type 2 yes there is a consensus statement which we had published uh, in JAPI, in our own journal, for a type 2 diabetes who are on oral anti-diabetic agents, where A.G. Unni Krishnan and myself was the uh, primary author. We have with us Sanjay Agarwal. He was also the part of this consensus statement. And we had used that using uh, oral, uh, even the patients who are on oral anti-diabetic agents, can we use the continuous glucose monitoring or ambulatory glucose profile? This is one more paper where V. Mohan had talked about the retrospective continuous glucose monitoring in patient of type 2 diabetes for optimizing the therapy for type 2 diabetes. This is the consensus which was international for continuous glucose monitoring. Whether all type 1 diabetic patients, all type 2 diabetic patients who are on insulin, all type 2 who are on hypoglycemic agent, they should be preferably on continuous glucose monitoring this was consensus where more than 35 experts from all over the world were there in 2017 i was lucky that i was part of this consensus meeting and i was the only one from asia who was representing uh, this as an international consensus on use of continuous glucose monitoring and we after one and a half years we had come out with a target that on continuous glucose monitoring what should be the time in range and time in range for any type 1 and type 2 garden variety of patients coming to your clinic more than 70 percent of the time their sugar should be between 70 to 180 it is not acceptable if their sugar goes below 70 for more than five percent of the time it is not acceptable if their sugar goes more than five percent of the time more than 250 if it goes we have to change the therapy similarly those who are elderly high risk for hypoglycemia we make it instead of 70 percent it should be 50 percent for pregnancy for type 1 slightly more tighter glycemic control instead of 70 to 180 it should be 63 to 140 and uh, again more than 70 percent of the time they should be in the same range gdm typical or type 2 who is becoming pregnant more than 90 percent of the time they should be in the tighter glycemic range between 63 to 140 this was one paper which was written by me and a time in range as a target in type 2 diabetes it's an urgent need for a type 2 diabetes also we have to move beyond a1c we have to come out with a time in range for type 2 diabetic patients these are the some of the papers to support that better the time in range lesser the complication whether it's a microvascular complication for type 1 as well as for type 2 diabetic patients too it was in 2019 when the time in range was published and the first association in the world in 2020, American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, they had put in their 11 principles of comprehensive management of type 2. I'm not talking of type 1. Type 1 is already well established fact all over the world. 
In type 2 diabetes management, also the continuous glucose monitoring should be used using continuous glucose monitoring whenever indicated to assist patient in reaching glycemic goal safely. The first association, association of clinical endocrinology in 2020, they had come that CGM should be the part of comprehensive management of type 2 diabetes patients. Also, we had again put few more papers using continuous glucose monitoring for improving monitoring and management of type 2 diabetes. And before even 2017 CGM guideline which was made in uh, Europe, we had come out in 2015 a consensus guideline for glycemic monitoring uh, in 2015 too. Recently, one more paper that how frequently one should go for time in range. How frequently for type 2 diabetes? Can we afford all our patients to do continuous glucose monitoring to achieve a tight glycemic control? And we were really difficult. And this was the recommendation from South Asia with Jyoti Dev, Anup Mishra and myself. We had come out the time in range and a frequency of continuous glucose monitoring can be done for patients who are uncontrolled every month. For those patients who are relatively controlled, maybe two months or three months, or those who have very good control, it could be done even six months to one year also because we are using intermittently, intermittent using this continuous glucose monitoring or professional CGM. So at this point of time, I will say these all three core glucose technique which are complementing each other. They are essential for type 1 and type 2, whether you talk of finger stick testing, which is a random blood glucose monitoring, A1C or continuous glucose monitoring. We have evidence more with type 1. We have also evidence for type 2, but still we can't say that only CGM is sufficient because all our patients can't afford for CGM and we can't have time in range for each and every patient. Let me talk with my last slide in two minutes that in how practical we are for type 2 diabetic patients. Let me give an example. This patient in 2018, in 9.2 HbA1c with three drugs, with gliptin, with metformin, and with sulfonylurea. Patient with 9.1. We all will agree that this patient will require insulin. As per guideline, triple drug already on sulfonylurea. There is no way by which patients can be good controlled by putting the patient on any fourth or fifth drug. Patient was... To be initiated by insulin only. Patient had gone to two, three diabetologists, endocrinologists of the city. They all advised the patient to start with the insulin therapy only. Patient had come to me. I also talked the same thing that insulin is required because you are 9.2 HbA1c with a triple drug oral, uh, oral anti-diabetic agents with sulfonylurea. Patient was not ready. We explained the patient and we asked the patient, let us get your continuous glucose monitoring. Let me do your FGM and see what happens. And the patient, when we call the patient on fifth day, you can see all on the first side of the graph, all sugar are high. Fasting was more than 180 almost. 180 it is touching. And 250 to 300, 350 was the post-meal glucose level. By all mean patient fit with the insulin therapy only. We explained the patient that we can think of GLP-1. That's what we can give. We can offer you SGLT2 if you are not ready for the insulin therapy. And uh, we can remove your gliptin part. So three things will be oral tablet and one will be injectable. To my surprise, we also asked the patient that every alternate day you have to call. I mean to our diabetic educator or our associate doctor or to myself, there is a possibility patient may go in hypoglycemia. Even on the 4 milligram glimipride was patient was taking, we made it 2 milligram on the day of prescribing the GLP-1. And patient, every alternate day patient was calling us and from 180 fasting sugar had come to almost 70. We reduced from 2 to 1 milligram of glimipride. Again, after 2 days, patient sugar was fasting was almost around 70 to 80. We again reduced it from that to half milligram and on the sixth day before coming to patient again call them that day we stopped the patient glimmy pride so when patient had come to us on 10th day patient was on glp1 patient was on sglt2 and patient was on metformin and you can see on the third side the graph is a 70 to 120 almost the sugar is absolutely well controlled and the patient was continued with this therapy and we explained the patient can now we will start continue with this yes it is injectable patient continued this for two years significant weight loss now we stop the patient glp1 also we stop the patient on sglt2 now he is only on metformin now why i am giving you this example that the guideline suggests us that this patient should go on this while doing a continuous glucose monitoring, it gives us the right direction and that is what the precision diabetology. We could understand from the history as well as by first graph that patient eating behavior, the carb content of the diet and patient what he is eating, that is responsible reason for them to have a sugar of 350 or 
250 or 180 fasting. But as soon as we changed the diet pattern, and that was uh, supported because of GLP-1 as patient we started, and you can see how SGLT-2 had worked in this particular patient. This may not be case for each and every patient, but that is what we have to treat patient individualized, not on the only on guideline based, and how the continuous glucose monitoring can help us for treating these type 2 diabetic patients in our clinic and getting absolutely well, I mean getting good control without getting hypoglycemia. This patient after 2 years had lost almost 15 kg of weight. Now only on metformin we can say it's almost reversal of diabetes and patient is only on lifestyle modification, none other than any other GLP-1 or any other medication. Uh, we can have multiple such example. You can have a patient only with fasting hyperglycemia, only with post-dinner. This is very interesting, you know, that sometime patient goes in the outside dinner, you can see the patient sugar level goes even up to 350. Normally, sugar post-dinner is not going more than 250 or 220. So, this will self-explanatory for the patient that, you know, how your outside dinner can increase your sugar up to 300 and that may be the reason for his A1C is getting uncontrolled. You may have post-lunch, post-breakfast, post-evening dinner. All these different type of pictures you can find in a continuous glucose monitoring. So we are using this professional CGM for monitoring, for motivating, for educating our type 2 diabetic patients to achieve a tighter glycemic control and without getting uh, increasing the hypoglycemic risk for these patients. So to summarize my talk, continuous glucose monitoring and achieving a tight uh, time in range assist in discovering unknown hyper and hypoglycemia. That is what the CGM is helping us in observation of glycemic variability, assessing percentage of time in range and percentage of out of range and in range. Someone say that if my patient is not able to achieve, my type 1 diabetic patient is getting multiple hypoglycemia, what should I do? You have to change the lifestyle. You have to change the therapy also. That is what we have to do. CVRT of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia during daytime and nighttime can be significantly reduced. It provides you actionable information because what action you have to take that depends on what type of CGM had come. Some patients we have to talk about the breakfast, some patients you have to talk about the dinner and that you can get only with this. Highlighting the impact of behavioral vari variances. It analyzes glycemic effects of new intervention effectively and efficiently. This will give you the, the new intervention which we had put like GLP-1 for this patient, other patient you had put on SGLT-2. You put some patients on an ultra long acting, short acting or ultra long acting insulin. That is going to give you uh, analyzing for that. It gives you the care for diabetes getting digitalized. Even in this COVID time, some of patients who are using continuous glucose monitoring when distantly they are monitoring and sending us reports only through uh, WhatsApp or message. So you are digitally getting connected with these patients also. With continuous glucose monitoring, it enhances patient self-management, adherence and confidence in diabetes management. With this, I thank, thank you very much.